Okay, so I yeah, let's get started. Uh, the lectures second uh, lecture on uh, inflationary reheating. So today the theme of today is the particle picture of reheating. So Marcos will give us the second of his lectures, please. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you again for uh, the introduction and uh, as. Uh, Professor Kimin has already mentioned uh, the, the topic is a little bit different this time. So uh, last time, what uh, I attempted to do at least was to show you how far we can go in the uh, regarding the macroscopic uh, picture of uh, reheating with perturbative methods. There were some very interesting questions at the end of the session in particular uh, regarding the validity of those results in the regime where uh, effective masses uh, for the decay products of the inflaton are uh, relevant for the determination of decay rates and uh, time dependence of energy densities and so on. So today um, we're going to stray away from that fluid picture that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, was built upon uh, the assumption that we can uh, think about in the inflaton and its decay products only in terms of uh, especially homogeneous uh, energy momentum tensors um, in a way. And uh, today I'm going to try to explore a little bit more of the microphysics. First, still within the perturbative uh, approximation for reasons that will probably become clear in a couple of slides. And then I'll work, uh, I will show you some uh, well, the formalism and some results for the non perturbative particle production during reheating. So, I think, uh, as uh, you know, to, to begin, it is a good idea to um, <clears throat> remind everyone of this slide that I showed the last time, where um, I write the form of the Boltzmann equation in the expanding universe for a particular degree of freedom. So I already discussed this in more detail yesterday. Again, this is just a reminder. Um, we're going to look at the, the particle picture. So we have to look at the microphysics and uh, perturbatively the microphysics are controlled by the phase space distribution. In this case, it is the one particle phase space distribution, sorry, of a certain um, a species a chi that participates in, in a one or several processes in the early universe. So as I mentioned last time, left-hand side is just the uh, free streaming term that is independent of coordinates and angles because the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. The right-hand side is a collision term. It depends on the amplitudes of the processes uh, as it goes forward or backward. Integral of the phase space distribution gives us the number density of the species and its uh, energy density if we weigh it by uh, the corresponding uh, zero entry of the four momentum of the um, of chi. Okay, where do I want to get with all these things? Okay, what I want to discuss um, right now is the way this phase space distribution of the decay products of the inflaton field evolves during reheating. Um, the evolution of this phase space density um, might sound a little bit pointless when one thinks of the uh, uh, overall uh, evolution of the universe, in particular, if you only care about the way the scale factor grows uh, during, uh, well, after the end of the inflation and how it is connected between inflation and radiation illumination, then there is really not, no need, at least perturbatively, to worry about the shape of the phase space distribution of the decay products of the inflaton because expansion only really cares about. Uh, the macroscopic parameters, in particular, the, um, the, what? the equation of state parameters. So here I'm showing schematically uh, the evolution of the universe during perturbative reheating. So this phi field, the inflaton field, slowly rolls during inflation until it comes sufficiently close to the uh, bottom of the potential and starts oscillating about the minimum. Okay, so we know uh, these oscillations decrease in amplitude. We know how they, they decrease in amplitude due to the expansion of the universe and due to the decay of phi. Um, but uh, this picture is going a little bit further than that because uh, I'm showing here explicitly, and, and by the way, this is the K equals to two. I'm going to be talking almost exclusively right now about quadratic uh, 
reheating unless explicitly stated. So uh, I'm trying to go a little bit further now because here I'm specifying that at the beginning of reheating, the plasma, which is shown here in, in gray, that is being populated by the decay of the inflaton is not going to be in thermal equilibrium, okay? So uh, after inflation, we uh, are left with a cold empty universe that is slowly being populated by the decay products of the inflaton. And so uh, on, until the elastic and inelastic interactions between these decay products are sufficiently efficient to bring this uh, primordial uh, radiation plasma into kinetic and chemical equilibrium, we cannot assume that uh, the plasma has any uh, particular temperature, okay? So uh, you might remember that we wrote T max and rho max the expressions for the maximum temperature of the universe, those are going to be corrected right now, precisely because we're going to look now at the micro uh, at the microphysics. So as I was saying, for macroscopic quantities like the scale factor, the uh, the only thing that really matters is the, the evolution of the equation of state parameter during, uh, well, before, during, and after reheating. But for other things, such as the production of um, dark relics, as I will hopefully have time to discuss tomorrow, the shape of these distributions is extremely important. And it can put uh, interesting constraints in the dynamics uh, of, uh, of reheating, OK? So uh, point is that after the end of inflation, we have three different periods of the evolution of the plasma. We have the early stages of reheating before thermalization, OK? We have the later stages of reheating after the, uh, after the plasma has been thermalized or after reheating where phi no longer populates the plasma and entropy is conserved, okay? So, <clears throat> sorry. So um, ideally then one would uh, attempt to, to compute the elastic and inelastic cross sections for the scattering so the decay products of the, of the inflaton substitute them into the Boltzmann equation and track numerically the evolution of the phase space distribution. Unfortunately, this is not a straightforward thing. So uh, we have to do things a little bit carefully and we have to build them uh, step by step. So the first stage of reheating is very simple uh, because we can compute this phase space distribution precisely due to the fact that the decay of the inflaton into a pair of particles, here I'm denoting them by psi and psi tilde, occurs uh, out of equilibrium. So uh, as we said, this decay process, we're assuming it only goes in this direction. So phi and the psi are not thermalized. And also the universe is very empty. So there, is, there are no meaningful interactions between uh, the decay products of, of phi. If that is the case, then the collision term for uh, the phase space distribution of the decay products can be written in a very uh, straightforward way. The only thing we have to worry about is the forward process. So this is the amplitude for that process. Uh, we have the phase space distribution of the inflaton and the phase space distributions of the decay products, all of these integrated with respect to the corresponding um, to the corresponding uh, Lorentz invariant um, phase space uh, uh, measure, okay? And uh, the fact that this f of phi, if you remember from uh, yesterday, is just the Dirac delta function because we're dealing with a condensate that is homogeneous in space, this integral can be immediately reduced to uh, this relatively simple expression here, okay? So let me see if I have something, no here okay so uh, point is that we have one direct delta here in in the time like coordinates we have a three-dimensional three direct delta that gets cancelled with one of these and this f of phi has another three-dimensional direct delta that gets cancelled with one of these so at the end we just keep the direct delta function in uh, in p0 and uh, the prefactor depends only on the number density of the inflaton field the decay rate, which here is assumed to be a constant because we're decaying into a pair of particles with a quadratic potential, okay? And it depends also on the phase space distribution then themselves of psi and psi tilde evaluated in particular these, uh, these two pieces evaluated at the kinematic energy of the decay products, which is just the, uh, this relation of the masses divided by the mass of the inflaton. So this is just kinematics, and this is a, ma a simple matter of substituting the rectal delta functions in the collision term. So uh, this is simple enough, 
we can actually simplify it even further if uh, for now we uh, forget about the the kinematic sorry the the yeah the masses of the uh, of the decay products we assume there's much smaller than the mass of the inflaton we did that yesterday as well uh, for the first part of the uh, for the lectures and if we also assume that the phase space distribution of these fields is much less than one meaning that there are no post einstein enhancement effects or any Pauli uh, fermi dirac sorry blocking effects when these are uh, present okay uh, sorry i will address this point later when neither these or these are satisfied but for now let's assume they are so uh, solving the Boltzmann equation then becomes a relatively simple, well, a very simple exercise. The dependence in the collision term of the phase space distribution goes away. We only have a simple right-hand side that depends on the Dirac delta function and a constant coefficient. And so we can solve explicitly the partial differential equation for uh, the phase space distribution of the decay products of the inflaton in terms of uh, an, a time-shifted integral, essentially. So that this prefactor is the same one here, and uh, this Dirac delta function gets translated into uh, Dirac delta in time, okay? So we have to integrate uh, over this delta, which is the same as evaluating n of phi and the Hubble parameter at this time t0, which is defined as the, um, the, the time that, um, solves this particular uh, constraint okay so um it is it essentially tells us how momentum gets redshifted with time and how that is translated into the form of the phase space distribution so this here is the solution for this uh, for this equation at the earliest uh, sorry not the earliest that uh, the yeah in the early stages of reheating well before the end of reheating we can uh, actually integrate this expression explicitly because we know that for w equals to zero the scale factor is that for uh, matter domination so this ratio a of t divided by a of t zero is nothing but t divided by t zero to the power um, two thirds okay that is equal to this ratio of the mass uh, of the inflaton divided by the corresponding momentum that we're looking at. So we can solve for T0 in a very simple way. And the resulting phase space distribution takes uh, this curious form, okay? It depends on uh, the number density. Now I have rewritten instead of the number density of phi, the number density of psi, um, because we can relate the two, okay? Uh, out of equilibrium, the number density in decay products of the inflaton can be computed just by counting how many inflatons have decayed uh, after a given moment in time. So if you uh, um, remember a little bit, rho n times this factor times the exponential told us uh, what was the time dependence of the energy density of the inflaton. In this case, we have one minus that so that we can count how many uh, rho phi, how many uh, phi's have been transformed into psi. So this is just a time dependent refactor, okay? The important thing is here. So uh, what we end up obtaining is a phase space distribution that scales with the negative three half power of the momentum, okay? And which has a sharp uh, cut at uh, P equals to M phi divided by two, which is something that is relatively simple to understand when uh, the inflaton decays at rest into two particles, then one, each one of the two particles has to carry with itself a momentum that is equal to one half of the mass of the inflaton, okay? So uh, this is the shape of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the spectrum of the distribution, so P squared times F, okay? Uh, it is picked precisely at the largest possible momentum, which is M5 divided by two. And as I was saying, uh, we can understand this uh, if we think of the decay of the inflaton as a discrete process, okay? So we start with an empty universe, the inflaton decays into a pair of particles. Those two particles can only have a momentum equal to M5 over two. So they populate the, uh, a vertical line in here. After the clock ticks again and the inflaton decays to another pair of particles, those, those particles are produced here with this momentum. But the previously produced particles have been redshifted by the expansion of the universe. So their, their momenta, their distribution has shifted to 
lower values of p. And also their amplitude has also been reduced due to the expansion of the universe. And this continues during the early stages of reheating, populating this tail to the left of the distribution, okay? But the important thing here is to note that uh, the bulk of the distribution is dominated, it's peaked at the maximum possible value of the end uh, of the of the momentum, which is uh, proportional to the mass of the inflaton. Okay, so this is what happens at the early stages of reheating. Now, as I said, after some time goes on, the universe is populated with more and more decay products of the inflaton. This distribution has to be converted uh, via interactions to the corresponding thermal distribution. It depends on whether or not the decay products are uh, bosons, so one plus or minus, depending on, uh, on, on the spin of the, of the decay products. But the point is that thermalization needs to uh, occur. Uh, now, there are two important things to, to understand uh, thermalization during reheating, OK? If we are to reach thermal equilibrium, the decay products have to do two things, OK? The first thing they have to do is that they have to slow down. As I said, the non-thermal distribution is dominated with, uh, with, uh, um, with particles that have a very high energy, whereas the thermal distribution uh, is peaked at the instantaneous temperature of uh, the plasma at that moment in time, which is necessarily smaller than the mass of the inflaton. So they have to slow down such that, so that the peak shifts to lower values of the momentum. And also, these decay products need to multiply. The decay of the inflaton does not populate the plasma as efficiently as one would need to reach thermal equilibrium in uh, the regime that uh, I am discussing right now. And that is very easy to understand, OK? In the absence of equilibrium, I already told you that we can just count how many inflatons have decayed to compute the number density for, uh, for the psi, for the decay products. This expression, I showed it two slides ago. But in thermal equilibrium, we also know how to compute the number density of uh, a relativistic uh, species or all of the relativistic species present in the plasma as a function of the temperature. Uh, so in equilibrium, this n depends on, on the cube of the uh, instantaneous temperature um, uh, of the universe, let's say. So uh, one can compare these two uh, number densities one can choose one particular moment in time. I decided to choose the, the, the moment in time where the radiation energy density is maximal. That is very close to the beginning of uh, reheating. And uh, the ratio of N of R, the thermal uh, uh, population, well, the thermal uh, number density to the non-thermal one is going to be bigger than one. You can just take the ratio and substitute uh, numbers. If the effective uh, coupling between the inflaton and matter is uh, less than the ratio of the inflaton mass to the Planck mass, which is about of the order of 10 to the minus 5, okay? This number is very important, okay? So we are going to work under the assumption that uh, this effective coupling is less than 10 to the minus 5, which corresponds to reheating temperatures of the order of... Uh, I don't want to lie, so let me hold that thought for a moment. Uh, I think it's 10 to 10 GV or so, but I, it's, it's easier to think about this, uh, this effective coupling. Because in a few slides, when I discuss the non-perturbative particle production, we're going to see that this condition is self-consistent with these two conditions, OK? So just as long as the coupling is sufficiently small, then the uh, initial uh, burst, sorry, the initially out of equilibrium produced particles are less populated than those in thermal equilibrium. So we have to slow down and multiply the decay products of the inflaton. Okay. So um, this has to happen through the uh, elastic and inelastic collisions in the plasma, as I mentioned before. Uh, in principle, uh, at least on paper, we should be able to get away with uh, solving, let's say, numerically the Boltzmann equation by simply substituting the corresponding cross sections and uh, numerically tracking the evolution of the phase space distribution. Uh, unfortunately, this is not uh, a straightforward uh, kind of analysis. 
And uh, this is due to the fact that we necessarily have to deal with gauge interactions and thermalization to gauge, through gauge interactions is quite tricky. Why am I saying we have to deal with gauge interactions? Because we want to populate the universe, not just with uh, some random degree of freedom, but at the end of the day, the universe has to be populated with all of the degrees of freedom of the standard model at sufficiently high temperatures. And this necessarily implies that these uh, particles are going to interact through gauge interactions and in particular through the strong, uh, through the strong interaction, okay? So why is this tricky? Well, uh, the first thing to think about are the uh, elastic processes, okay? So if, let's say, if the Boltzmann equation can be used to track the evolution of the phase space distribution of the particles, then the elastic collision term would necessarily have a form that looks roughly like this one, okay? So we're tracking elastic processes, in particular two to two uh, scatterings, okay? So we have to involve uh, now four particles. So here's the momentum of, uh, well, P0, K0, P0 prime, K0 prime. Okay, we have to involve all of the phase space distributions and the corresponding Lorentz invariant um, weights. Issue here is that uh, at low momentum transfer, when one, has, when one uh, exchanges uh, the gauge bosons, uh, or equivalently at small angles, the elastic cross-section generically diverges. So this uh, effective amplitude tends to have uh, problems naively in the infrared, okay? So this is a computational problem that needs to be regulated by introducing an, what is known as an effective screening scale. So the idea behind this is that uh, this scale is going to parameterize the effect of successive scatterings in the plasma that essentially are going to forbid the momenta of these particles to become vanishingly small, okay? And in general, it can be determined by uh, the form of the instantaneous phase space uh, distribution, okay? In thermal equilibrium, this uh, screening scale is nothing but the effective thermal mass that we discussed yesterday in the context of uh, old inflation, if you remember, okay? So, particles in, in a medium acquire effective masses that are related with screening effects and which can be determined through the uh, corresponding phase space distribution. Pragmatically, um, this only means essentially that kinetic equilibrium can be reached uh, uh, rather quickly. In fact, using this screening scale and approximating this, uh, sorry, this, um, this cross section, okay, one can generically, uh, well, one can estimate the rate of uh, elastic uh, collisions compared to the Hubble parameter. This is, again, you can find it in, uh, in these references. And this ratio is generically of this order. So this alpha is the gauge coupling that mediates this process and M phi times T is, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the natural uh, time uh, units for reheating, so uh, it counts essentially how many oscillations we have for uh, the gauge, um, sorry, for the strong uh, gauge coupling, let's say this is uh, of the order of 10 to the minus one or so at very high temperatures. Um, so uh, that would mean that we need of the, the order of 10 to a, to a few tenths of oscillations for these elastic processes to become comparable to the Hubble parameter and therefore lead to the effective um, kinetic, let's say, equilibration of the, of the decay products. Inelastic processes are even more subtle, let's say. Um, the reason for, for this trickiness now is that uh, due to its interaction with the plasma, a, a particle which is uh, represented here by, by the horizontal line, okay, can lose momentum by emitting a uh, gauge boson. So this is just the, the Bremsstrahlung process in, in the presence of the, of the plasma, okay? Problematically though, uh, if this energetic particle is ultra relativistic, then gauge bosons uh, emitted at small angles, okay? Almost collinearly with the, with the highly energetic particle will not be out of phase even if they are emitted at different times. So here I'm schematically showing, you know, a particle being hit by uh, the other uh, 
you know, by the other particles present in the plasma. These interactions induce the emission of this uh, gauge boson almost collinearly. That can happen, you know, at one time or it can happen at later times. And uh, it turns out, as I mentioned, that if this angle of emission is very small, these two processes are not exactly uh, uncorrelated. The formation time for these gauge bosons actually exceeds the uh, mean free time between uh, scatterings in the plasma. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, a subtle uh, effect. It is known as the LPM or Landau, Pomer, and Chuk Migdal effect. And uh, the problem with this, uh, with this um, kind of uh, result is the fact that it violates one of the fundamental assumptions behind the Boltzmann formalism. If you, um, uh, if you remember, if you know, uh, the Boltzmann uh, equation is built upon in part uh, on the, what is known as the molecular chaos assumption, right? That particles are uncorrelated prior to collisions. And so the collision term uh, can be written purely in terms of the one particle distribution functions. But here, the, these processes, since they're not uncorrelated, depend not just on the uh, single particle uh, phase space distribution, but they depend on the two particle, three particle, and so on distribution functions. So instead of having a simple Boltzmann equation, one would think that uh, you would need a full, um, how is it called, the BBJKY uh, hierarchy of uh, equations to be able to determine the uh, effect in the, uh, in the evolution of the particles in the plasma. Okay, uh, so that's not necessarily the case, okay, as I will show in, in, in the next slides. But uh, in any case, one can compute the effective rate at which this Bremsstrahlen process uh, proceeds, okay. So the emission time for a near collinear process for a gauge boson that can extract a momentum that is comparable to the momentum of this original relativistic uh, particle is given by a relatively simple expression that can be written in terms of the mean free time between collisions, that is this tau, the energy of the decay product, the energy of this uh, horizontal uh, line, and uh, which is comparable to the mass of the inflaton, as I was trying to argue before, and the transverse uh, momentum exchange, okay? So um, this uh, momentum exchange is related to the screening scale this tau can be shown to be uh, proportional to the number density of the particles in the plasma. Okay, and um, the production rate for uh, a hard gluon, so we call well, gluon or, uh, or gauge boson, okay? We call a particle hard if it has an energy comparable to, uh, let's say, the energy of the inflaton, okay? As the, uh, as the primary decay products have, okay? So the, the, the production rate um, of, of a hard gauge boson can be estimated, okay? It can be written like uh, in this form. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it, it can be shown to be much bigger than one before the end of reheating, okay? In fact, um, Okay, so yeah, it can be it can be shown to be much bigger than one before the end of reheating. It's a little bit tricky here because this this ratio depends on the ratio of the masses and the value of gamma phi times t. But uh, but one can check that you don't have to wait until the end of uh, reheating for this process to become uh, efficient. So uh, the the branching of the hard uh, decay products into other particles can be, can become sorry, can lead to an efficient uh, chemical equilibration of the plasma before the end of reheating. But another thing that one can check is that this uh, rate, sorry, this um, branching has to occur at times that are, sorry, at times that uh, are um, larger than the time scale when the maximum energy density of the radiation products uh, is achieved. Okay, if you remember, we called that rho max uh, last time, implying that the real maximum temperature of the uh, relativistic plasma is model dependent and smaller than the naive T max that we computed last time, assuming uh, instantaneous thermalization. Okay, and I'm going to show a plot. Uh, in a minute, okay? So this is just a simple estimate of the, of the hard branching effect, including the landau pomeranchuk migdal uh, suppression. It turns out 
that uh, some people, some very smart people, have been able to use the splitting rate to construct an effective Boltzmann equation. I told you it's, it's in principle impossible to write a Boltzmann, a Boltzmann equation because, uh, because of this interference. But uh, what some people have, uh, have, uh, have shown is that you can actually resum these, uh, these splitting diagrams into an effective, um, sorry, <clears throat> into an effective splitting term that includes the, the LPM interference, okay? So, so they write schematically the Boltzmann equation as uh, the elastic uh, collision term and a resumed effective inelastic uh, collision term, okay? The details are, of course, too complicated to discuss in, these, uh, in this lecture. And to be honest, I am not a big expert on, on this, but I think the results are uh, very interesting and worth discussing. Uh, what they find is that it is not a, it is actually not the, the splitting the splitting into the hard primaries which mainly uh, thermalizes the plasma, uh, but instead what they find is that the thermalization mostly relies on the population of what is called uh, as a soft sector of particles, which by definition is a sector with of particles which energy is much smaller than the uh, than the mass of the interval. Okay. So here's a schematic picture of the evolution of the phase phase distribution. Initially, the distribution contains only the extremely high, uh, highly energetic particles that I uh, discussed before. So it has a spectrum that goes like uh, momentum to the minus three halves, okay? These decay products will emit copious amounts of uh, almost collinear soft radiation almost immediately after they, they, they are created, okay? Again, soft radiation means uh, particles that are much less energetic than these uh, primary decay products, okay? So they, they, they produce a lot of uh, collinear soft radiation, and this soft bath, uh, which has a, a distribution that goes like uh, K to the minus seven halves, this is the uh, landau pomer and chuk migdal suppressed spectrum, okay? So uh, it, uh, it is complicated to compute, but they, they, they can estimate it, okay? This soft uh, bath of particles quickly becomes overpopulated. So it ha the opposite happens with respect to these uh, very energetic tails. So they become overpopulated and they reach thermal equilibrium very quickly. So the distribution has uh, an almost thermalized uh, piece, uh, LPM suppressed part. This here is just an interpolation between the two. It's called as the vacuum cascade. I don't I'm going to go into any details. And the highly energetic decay products of the inflaton. Okay, so now we have a soft thermal background and the primary decay products. And this soft thermal background is going to provide a medium that is going to be capable of slowing down the subsequent decay products of the inflaton through uh, multiple scatterings. Okay. And uh, this highly energetic tail will be erased after some time, okay? So the, at later times, the distribution contains the thermally equilibrated species. It has still the uh, LPM suppressed spectrum because it doesn't fully go away. Phi keeps de uh, decaying, but it, it shrinks over time. So at the end, you get just um, a, therm a thermally equilibrated uh, distribution. And the time scale at which this stopping of the phi decay products is essentially instantaneous is what is associated with the thermalization time scale. Okay, so it can be written uh, in an approximate form. Uh, this is the corresponding expression. So T th is a thermalization time scale again when you can ignore this uh, this uh, p to the minus three half uh, highly energetic tail and instead assume that the plasma is now in thermal equilibrium. It uh, depends, of course, on the gauge coupling strength that mediates the elastic and inelastic processes. It depends on the decay rate of the inflaton and on the mass of the inflaton. And it uh, annoyingly has these uh, funny powers, six, 16 fifths and two fifths, that sometimes make computations a little bit uh, complicated. But um, all I'm trying to argue is that the naive picture that we have from the previous lecture has to be modified in particular for the mean energy of, uh, of, the, decay, of the decay products. 
So uh, instead of the mean momentum of these decay products being determined by the instantaneous temperature, which is this uh, dashed line and then the black line. So if you remember, I showed this uh, before, this would be T max and this would be T reheating. That doesn't happen in reality. What happens is that the mean momentum is determined initially by the mass of the inflaton, which is much higher than, uh, than the maximum temperature of the universe for the hard sector, for the particles that are produced directly from the decay of the inflaton, and by the temperature of the soft background, okay, uh, until at uh, the thermalization time scale, they just merge and follow the uh, naive temperature curve, okay? So uh, this thermalization temperature can be estimated um, can be estimated easily if one knows when thermalization happens. And, um, and it's given by this complicated expression. But the point is that the real maximum temperature of the universe can be a few orders of magnitude lower than uh, the naive Dmax that I discussed last time. Okay, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. So all of this uh, is, as I said, hopefully tomorrow I can show you the, the, the relevance of these, uh, of these dynamics for the production of particles uh, from the scattering of these, uh, from scatterings in the primordial uh, thermal bath. And this result only applies for k equals to two, for a quadratic uh, inflaton potential, okay? If we have k bigger than two, uh, things can be a little or a lot more complicated, okay? Um, why, why is that the case? Well, uh, yesterday we discussed that uh, for potentials that are not quadratic at the minimum, the nature of the final state matters a lot to determine the rate at which the inflaton energy density is dissipated into relativistic uh, decay products. So if you find the case into fermions or into bosons or into gauge bosons, which we didn't discuss yesterday, or if I the case through multi-body decays, then uh, the decay rate is going to be different. And so here you have to solve the, the, the equations on a case by case basis, something that definitely hasn't been done fully in the literature. And uh, the other thing is, of course, you have to keep in mind the condensate effects and um, in medium effects that uh, for quartic potentials or flatter potentials, can be uh, extremely important, okay? So in fact, the, the decay rate can be affected, not, not just the, not just the um, uh, elastic and inelastic collision rates, but also the decay rate of the inflaton can be affected by these uh, screening effects. There are some things done in the literature, but I think it's, it's far from being a, a, a you know, a closed uh, matter. So this, I would say it's still an open question. For this reason, I'm not going to say too much about this. Also, because uh, for flatter potentials, non-perturbative dynamics can become important very quickly. And so the next step then is to answer the question, what happens when the conditions that I mentioned before are violated, okay? What happens if the coupling between the inflaton and matter and radiation is bigger than 10 to the minus five, and in particular, what happens if these phase space distributions are large, okay? When that is the case, we have to uh, abandon somewhat the perturbative assumption and we have to deal with non-perturbative um, particle production, okay? So that will be the, the next uh, point in the, um, for this um, session. Okay, uh, you tell me when you want to take a break, uh, so uh, I can I can continue uh, talking in the meantime. So uh, we now look at non perturbative. Before that, can I ask you a simple question? So yes. in your previous slides, uh, uh, one more slide, yeah, one more, yeah, yeah, in this plot. So actually, we obtained this uh, dot line from the phenomenological description of the decay of the inflaton. So can I take this plot as a, let's say, uh, that kind of phenomenological description is only valid when T is larger than T summer? Uh, yes, yes, essentially, yes. Uh, well, sorry, it, that, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, unfair, let's say. So the, the evolution of the energy densities that we computed last time, that one is, is essentially not affected, okay? 
what uh, what is affected is the the underlying distribution of energies for the particles that live in the in the thermal plasma so uh, the plots where I was showing um, rho, for example, as a function, so the energy densities as a function of time or the scale factor, those are unaffected because, um, again, those, those, those are the result of integrating over uh, the phase space distribution and uh, obtaining just this set of uh, ordinary differential equations, let's say. So they have hidden um, below them all these complicated uh, thermalization uh, scenarios, but the energy density has to be the same, okay? So that is the constraint. But for the effective uh, temperature of the plasma, which we also discussed last time, yes, you cannot assume the distribution is thermal until you reach this point. So from here onwards, uh, the radiation is in thermal equilibrium. You can just use the Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein distributions without any problems. But the uh, real distribution for the particles in the in uh, for the decay products of the inflaton is going to be uh, well more complicated in this in this regime. Okay, in particular, this one, the transition from non-equilibrium to equilibrium, is a little bit hard. So that's why you know people draw these uh, qualitative uh, plots on top of this uh, on top of this plateau. Uh, the distribution is simply this one. Uh, the p to the minus three half multiplied by the theta. And I'm going to show an animation in, 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 a, in a couple of slides. Uh, does that more or less answer the question or? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's very clear. Okay, what? thank you. Uh, I have another question. So yes. the, the, T, the T, TH here is the reheating temperature or the temperature which the thermal equilibrium reached. Yeah, yeah so the Sorry, the reheating temperature would be down here in the star. Okay, so that one is is still the one that we computed last time, proportional to the square root of the decay rate of the inflat of the inflaton multiplied by the Planck mass. So that one is unchanged. This TTH is the temperature at uh, thermalization. So in a sense, it is the correct maximum temperature of the universe in thermal equilibrium. Uh, if that's if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay, but it's not the reheating temperature. The reheating temperature is down here, and that one is unchanged. It's still the same one that the same one that we computed uh, yesterday. So, uh, if the thermal radiation is not instantaneous, then uh, no, typically you assume that the radiation produced during reheating, uh, you assume uh, radiation energy density to be proportional to the radiation temperature to the force. I mean, yes. during, during reheating and then uh, you also use, use it to compute, uh, for instance, dark matter production from uh, thermal scattering. Exactly. So that, that assumption depends on the, I mean, uh, assumption that the thermal radiation is instantaneous. Yes. If, it's not the, if it's not the case, uh, how do you compute? How do you, uh, uh, include uh, I mean, thermal scattering during yes, yes. And before this, thermal radiation? This is a very good question. That's the subject of next uh, tomorrow's uh, uh, lecture, let's say. Mm -hmm. so, uh, th this bit is very important, as you say, for the production of dark matter from scatterings in the plasma. Mm -hmm. So the, the instantaneous thermalization assumption is this dotted line, so mm -hmm. this will be max, and then mm -hmm. it, redshifts as we mm -hmm. expect redshift mm -hmm. but yes uh, the fact that this distribution is not thermal is going to affect a lot the production of uh, of uh, dark relics mm -hmm. so but right now i don't want to uh, uh, still say uh, you know how the effect is computed because that's what i'm planning on doing tomorrow so what i want to do now is to mm -hmm. see how this distribution changes when the coupling is big mm -hmm. that makes sense so then uh if uh, I mean the thermalization, instantaneous thermalization might be valid for certain uh, parameter space, probably, right? Uh, it depends. Yes. So yeah, you can yeah, think yeah. of, for example, the the inflaton decaying into some particles that have very large Yukawa interactions with each mm. other. So mm. uh, instead of the thermalization being delayed all the way down here, it mm. can happen very quickly. Mm. Yeah. And the whole large coupling. But it depends on the coupling. It depends mm. on the interaction. So what mm -hmm. this uh, very smart people did was to mm -hmm. 
kind of work out a generic scenario in which you have the standard model that thermalizes through the strong gauge interaction. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, but you can have more uh, more uh, rapid thermalization if the if you make the couplings uh, stronger. Essentially, mm -hmm. they don't have to be gauge interactions at, at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Okay, so yeah, that's the that's the gist of this point. I'm just trying to emphasize the fact that you have to be careful with the assumptions that you make. Okay, the fact that you can compute energy densities doesn't mean that you can compute uh, underlying uh, physical quantities such as mean momenta or temperatures and so on. You have to look at the microphysics. You have to look at the phase space distribution to uh, get the correct uh, answer. Okay. So, as I said, what happens if we violate the assumptions that we uh, imposed earlier today and yesterday? So there was a very good question yesterday that was questioning the perturbative, the validity of the perturbative approximation for computing the decay rate of the inflaton because it was ignoring the short time scale uh, oscillation of phi that induces uh, non-adiabaticity and therefore excites uh, the, the momentum modes of the fields that are coupled to the inflaton. So that corresponds to non-perturbative particle production, which is known in the literature as preheating, okay? And uh, the idea behind preheating is very simple. Here, I always like to at least mention for a couple of seconds the, the, you know, the simple example, let's say. So, um, if we have, uh, we learn about these uh, process in our quantum field theory courses, if we have, for example, a time dependent, well, sorry, a sufficiently strong uh, electric field, let's say, after a, a certain threshold is met, this field can induce the, the production of uh, pairs of particles uh, from the vacuum, okay, because uh, of the mixing of positive and negative frequency modes. So this is known as the Schringer effect in, in in QEV, okay? So this, this effect is simply there because, uh, well, the, the background contains a field that has a very, uh, has a lot of energy that is inducing uh, a time dependent, uh, a time dependence of the effective frequencies of the, of the fields coupled to it. During reheating, we precisely have this. The inflaton provides an oscillating background just because it is, uh, uh, you know, sloshing about its uh, its uh, its minimum, okay, and oh, sorry, yeah, okay, so it's sloshing about its minimum, and uh, that means the the effective masses of the of the uh, of the for the particles that are coupled to the inflaton can will be affected by this oscillation. They will become time dependent, rapidly oscillating, and therefore this non adiabaticity can lead to copious uh, particle production. So for definiteness in what I'm, in what follows, I am going to stick to uh, one well to a couple of particular examples. Okay, if we want to determine the non-perturbative production of particles during reheating, we have to make a few uh, a few um, assumptions. Okay, so the first assumption, of course, is that you need to know what the what what the potential for the inflaton is here uh, for the numerics that I will choose that I will show. I'm choosing a, a hyperbolic tangent potential, which is known as the T model potential. I forgot to put the reference here, but the, the references are a little bit later, I think. Um, the, the, this form of the potential is not exactly important. The only important point here is that near the minimum, the oscillation is uh, harmonic. So this potential is quadratic near the minimum. All right, so that's the, that, again, I'm sticking to the quadratic case. Um, and I'm, to it, I'm going to couple, let's say, a scalar field through the four leg vertex that we uh, encountered yesterday with a coupling sigma. So the effective mass that we also wrote yesterday uh, is proportional to the square root of sigma and the absolute value of phi. And uh, I'm also going to consider the direct coupling of the inflaton to uh, a fermion field, okay, through the Yukawa coupling. So again, the squared effective mass of this field is proportional to the square of, uh, of the instantaneous value of phi. So phi oscillates, then these masses also oscillate, all right? And yes, this is k equals to two, so it's a matter like um, dominated era during the heat, right? So what happens, oops, what happens when we have this behavior, okay? 
we can take this uh, Lagrangian and write down the equation of motion. So, so not now that we're not going to be dealing with the energy momentum tensors for phi or for chi or for psi. What I want to do now is to take this uh, uh, Lagrangian, compute the equation of motion directly for the quantum fields and see if uh, I can understand the heating from this, okay? So that's the that's the procedure I'm going to be doing. Uh, you take this uh, set of equations, this Lagrangian, you compute the equation of motion for chi, and you obtain uh, um, an equation that looks like this one. Okay, so here uh, I have not only um, used the Euler Lagrange equations to find uh, the equation of motion for chi, I've also taken the Fourier transform with respect to the spatial coordinates so that I am looking at the time evolution of the momentum modes of this field chi, okay? So if you, this, this is the Fourier transform of chi, okay? So instead of the spatial gradient, I have the momentum B of here, multiplying chi, chi of P. And the equation of motion looks like this one, okay? It's the usual equation for a scalar, the, the Klein-Gordon equation. You have the derivative, the, you have the acceleration, you have the velocity with the same friction term that we had for the inflaton. But now, uh, you know, the momentum is not going to be uh, equal to zero. This is not going to be a homogeneous field, but it actually, the, the momentum modes are going to be excited. And uh, the effective mass of this field, again, in the absence of an explicit mass term, is going to be, is going to be given, sorry, by uh, this expression. And you can see there is a typo here because there's no one half and there is a one half here. So I, I apologize for that. This is just because of the way you choose the, the coupling here. So I'm going to be using this convention, not this one. So I, I, I apologize for that mistake. Uh, but anyway, uh, you obtain, one obtains uh, an equation that looks like this one. And it is very, um, and I don't want to say interesting. It is very, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, instructive, yes. It is very instructive to study this equation in uh, the limit first when uh, expansion can be neglected, okay? When, when we neglect expansion, the scale factor is just a constant, so we can make it equal to one. And uh, this piece dependent on the Hubble parameter just goes away. So you can see we obtain the equation of motion for a harmonic oscillator, but in this case, the mass is not a constant in time. It depends on the instantaneous value of the field phi. And when and this can be uh, under, sorry, this essentially mimics uh, the mechanical system of having an oscillator coupled to a time dependent force, okay? So we expect to see the phenomenon of parametric resonance uh, appearing into the system. And indeed, that's what happens. Uh, is, again, if we neglect expansion, the oscillation of the inflaton contains the harmonic motion, but it doesn't contain the decaying uh, amplitude because there is, no, there is no Hubble friction. So it just keeps oscillating with the same amplitude. And at some point in time during, the, during this oscillation, it crosses zero, it changes sign. This effective mass, as it is constructed, does not change sign, but it goes through zero. And that means there is a sudden change because this change is uh, a little bit steep. So there is a sudden change in the instantaneous value of the effective mass that results in uh, jumps in the amplitude of the oscillation of uh, the momentum mode. So this is the real part of chi of p. Again, m phi of t is the natural time scale for the oscillation of the inflaton. And you can see here, every time phi crosses zero, there is a jump in the uh, amplitude of the oscillation of the field, okay? So um, here we have precisely this phenomenon of uh, resonance, okay? The amplitude is being enhanced by the non adiabatic behavior of the effective mass as phi crosses zero. And uh, we can go even further than that because this field is not just a classical field, it's a quantum field. So we can quantize it and upon quantiz quantization compute the occupation number for the corresponding uh, momentum, uh, momentum mode. It can be calculated in this way, okay? And uh, one sees uh, precisely that each one of these jumps is translated into the production of particles, okay? So you see it grows like a stair here because the crossings are uh, discrete, okay? 
But this occupation number is growing very quickly as a function of time. You see, this is a log scale, whereas this is a linear scale. So n of p is growing exponentially fast uh, during, uh, during this oscillation. This exponential growth uh, is, is essentially a manifestation of the Bose-Einstein statistics of uh, a scalar field. The bosons like to build up, okay? You can put arbitrarily many bosons in a particular uh, state and uh, the system likes to do that, okay? Uh, if you include expansion now, so you turn on the time dependence of the scale factor and the Hubble parameter, then of course the oscillation of the inflaton contains the decaying amplitude uh, component, okay? And now uh, the parameters that control the resonance, as I will discuss in more detail in, in a couple of slides, become time dependent. And so uh, the uh, parametric uh, resonance stops being, let's say, deterministic like this one and becomes quasi-stochastic, okay? Uh, in terms of a canonically normalized uh, field, so this X uh, leads to the canonically normalized uh, uh, action, let's say, the, the real part of the oscillation now looks like this. There's still the, the parametric enhancement, the growth of the momentum modes, but you see it is disordered now because the parameters that control the resonance are now changing as a function of time. Same thing happens with the occupation numbers. These occupation numbers are still growing and they grow very fast, but they do it in a quasi disordered way. So if you wish, we can stop now for the, for the break and then I can mm -hmm. come back mm -hmm. to the floor. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, if you have a, any question until this point, you can ask, and then we have a, some a break after that. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding on the summarization. Maybe you might uh, have already mentioned, but uh, I want to understand uh, under what kind of situation uh, this kind of uh, uh, detail of the summarization would be important or not. Uh, for example, uh, you say if the coupling is strong, the uh, summarization becomes instantaneous, right? Yes. Uh, so I want to uh, find a parameter, or is there any good combination of parameter uh, we should consider to judge the system is instantaneous summarization or not? Yes, yes, yes. That, 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 is a, that is a fantastic question. So I would say the following. Naively, what you can do is uh, compute, let's say, the, the scattering, so the elastic scattering rate, um, given your particular uh, favorite uh, form kind of interaction, OK? So mm -hmm. if you have an interaction, you can compute the 2 to 2 uh, scattering rate, compare it to the Hubble parameter. If that thing is bigger than, than 1, then uh, you can assume the, the process happens uh, essentially instantaneously. And the same goes for the inelastic uh, rate. So if you can compute this thing and it becomes bigger than 1 uh, very quickly, then you have now a, uh, chemical and kinetic equilibrium, and therefore you can assume your system is in thermal equilibrium. Uh, the, what, what I wanted to emphasize uh, with this uh, presentation is the fact that in the case of thermalization through gauge interactions, these naive uh, expressions are not uh, enough, let's say. So the thermalization timescale that this particular rate predicts is actually smaller than the one that you get by doing the, the correct Boltzmann uh, computation. And all of this is related with the annoying fact that, again, at uh, almost collinear processes, that is infrared uh, effects um, blow up for uh, gauge interactions. So you're interchanging a massless uh, mediator, and, and, and this makes uh, you know, the naive computation trickier than it should be. You have to involve uh, screening, you have to involve uh, interference and so on. So the computations are much harder than, than they should be. If you, if you have in mind, for example, just a theory that contains scalars, so you have only thermalization through uh, contact interactions, then you don't have to do all these things because those, those uh, uh, those uh, collision terms are not going to blow up and you can very easily uh, estimate the elastic and inelastic rates uh, to see if your 
uh, if your um, plasma thermalizes sufficiently fast. And they are going to depend on the strength of the coupling. In this case, the, I think the value of this computation is the fact that it is generic. So no matter what you do, let's say, if the inflaton decays into some standard model particles, then this is the latest uh, you can thermalize, if that makes sense, okay? You can introduce stronger coupling, so that means thermalization is going to happen earlier, but it definitely is not going to happen later because, you know, this is the baseline in the standard model. You, at the very least, you have gauge interactions. So, um, so, so I think this is a valuable result. Uh, if I don't know if you agree with, with that. Uh, I understand. Thank you. Maybe I can come back here. Okay. Okay, uh, then uh, let's uh, come back at the at uh, eleven fifteen. Fifteen, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah. In in thirteen minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, so um, before the break, I was mentioning um, the very basics of the parametric uh, excitation of a scalar field in the presence of the oscillation of the inflaton. And I thought that, of course, any discussion of preheating would be incomplete with at least briefly talking about what is known as Floquet theory. All right, so this. Uh, uh, this theory is usually addressed by introducing an alternative rescale field. So uh, here I introduce this canonically normalized field X, which is A times chi. Uh, to understand Floquet theory, people introduce a different field. So it's little X, which is A to the minus three house times chi. Okay, so that's the uh, change such that the equation of motion for the commoving momentum modes in cosmic time is precisely oscillator-like. So the Hubble friction is not present here, but it has been moved inside the uh, effective frequency uh, of, the, of the field. So it depends on uh, P, over a, P, P over a squared, the effective mass of the field. And then this bit here, that uh, depends on the equation of state parameter and the Hubble parameter, right? Now, this one is important uh, in some regimes because during inflation and shortly after the end of inflation, this term is negative. The equation of state parameter, remember, at the end of inflation is minus one third. And uh, this can lead to uh, either a suppression of the expected particle production rate or even to the tachyonic growth of superhorizon modes because uh, effective sorry, the squared frequencies become uh, negative, right? But uh, let's for the moment ignore that. In any case, if we wait long enough, this term vanishes because the equation of state parameter during quadratic reheating goes to zero very quickly, right? So you can uh, get rid of it uh, after one or two oscillations. Now, uh, we're going to be talking about k equals to two, a quadratic potential. And so that means the periodic function that appears uh, in the expression for phi of t, the curly p that I introduced yesterday, is just a cosine, uh, all right? So the evolution equation can be rewritten in terms of some uh, standardized uh, rescale values, all right? So such that the uh, result looks like the standard Matthew equation that uh, describes the parametric excitation for a mechanical system with uh, harmonic forcing. So you see the, the time coordinates in this case is just m phi t shifted by some uh, phase, which is more, more or less irrelevant. This Q is known as the resonance parameter. It is uh, essentially given by the uh, oscillated, oscillation average effective mass of the field divided by the mass of the inflaton. And this parameter A of P, which I don't know if it, if it has a proper name, is nothing but a rescaled momentum by the mass of the inflaton uh, shifted by the value of Q, all right? So uh, we take this variable so that, again, this equation looks like this. 
takes the form of the standard uh, Matthew equation, which is the equation that uh, mathematicians use to describe uh, this parametric excitation of a forced uh, oscillating mechanical system, right? And as such, this equation has been extensively studied in the literature. And uh, for the case of a constant A and Q, which is not the case in the presence of expansion, but let's say, uh, you know, as we did before, we, we for now uh, think of these two parameters as being approximately constant. Uh, then the uh, theorem by Floquet guarantees that the solution for X can be written in a form uh, that generically looks like this one, okay? So it is a linear combination, well, it is a combination, sorry, of uh, two periodic functions, okay? What, what weight by uh, exponential terms, okay? So these uh, parameters here, the mu of P is known as the Floquet exponent, all right? And uh, for weight numbers, such that this Floquet exponent has a, a real part, uh, then the field fluctuations are going to grow exponentially fast. You see, if this mu is purely imaginary, then uh, these exponentials can be reabsorbed inside the periodic functions. And so X of P only oscillates, it's not growing uh, parametrically. But if there is a real part of this mu, then we have exponential growth from either one of these two uh, exponentials. And the uh, occupation number also grows exponentially fast in this case at twice the rate. So that is the manifestation again of the parametric uh, uh, excitation. One, uh, one can even draw an instability chart for the Matthew equation, which is this chart shown as a function of the resonance parameter and the parameter A of P. Okay, and uh, the meaning of this chart is the following. In the colored region, there are no exponentially growing solutions. Okay, so the motion, so the yeah, the motion of X is stable, while in the white region, uh, resonance growth, resonant growth, sorry, can occur. All right, so that's the unstable uh, instability bands um, because they look like bands. All right. Uh, in the case when this uh, resonance parameter, this Q, is much smaller than one. Okay, so remember it's related to the ratio of the masses. If it is much smaller than one, then we have what is known as narrow response, okay? So essentially the instability, remember this is Q, so it happens almost along the vertical axis. This uh, instability occurs only uh, inside of very narrow strips that are located at uh, around A equals to N squared. You see here is one, four, nine, 16, and so on. This line is supposed to go all the way to the, to the origin. It's just a little bit complicated to plot such a narrow uh, instability band, okay? And uh, they have a width that is proportional to the tiny parameter Q, okay? So they are located at these points, at these values, and the width is proportional to Q, which has to be assumed to be very small, okay? Um, in particular, for the first resonance band, which is down here, the Floquet exponent can be estimated. It goes like Q divided by two. So it is not exactly uh, huge, but you get uh, an exponential growth. And uh, the width of the uh, resonance band is just uh, Q, two Q, sorry, two Q. It's centered at one, and then it goes plus Q and minus Q. So this is all in the absence of expansion. Again, Q and A are, are constants. If one now turns on expansion, then uh, both Q and A become functions of time. And in this plot, they follow lines that look like these gray trajectories, okay? So we are not stuck in one point in the parameter space, but we actually evolve along these, uh, uh, sorry, along these uh, planes towards uh, the origin, essentially, all right? Uh, one can then uh, estimate the time that a mode is going to spend inside a particular resonance band. For the first resonance band, this time uh, is approximately given by this expression, Q times uh, Q divided by H, sorry, which corresponds to a growth in uh, the occupation number that is given by this amount, okay? So it's related to the magnitude of uh, the ratio of the masses and the ratio of the Eplaton mass to the Hubble parameter. 
Now, of course, it could happen that the mode doesn't cross any band, and then therefore there will not be uh, any explosive, any exponential particle production. And one can check that that corresponds to this ratio uh, being uh, less than order one, essentially. So that happens when this uh, exponent in the exponential is, of course, very small. And that occurs when this ratio sigma over lambda uh, square is uh, less than order one. Uh, this effective coupling, which is the ratio of the, let, let's go back up here, is the ratio of the phi chi coupling and this coupling here in the inflaton potential, which is going to be determined by the amplitude of the CMB uh, fluctuations, is going to appear all the time uh, in the following, and it will determine the uh, strength of the um, uh, the strength of the of the interaction essentially. If you remember, actually, I already mentioned this ratio yesterday in the context of the curly R when we were discussing um, the kinematic blocking effect in perturbative uh, reheating. Okay, so this is narrow resonance, narrow because it happens in the narrow range where of the of the resonance band. When the resonance parameter is large. Um, but maybe not much bigger than one, but bigger than one at least. The uh, bands are broader, as you can see, they broaden away from Q equals to zero. And uh, we are in a highly non perturbative regime because the, uh, well, the resonance, first of all, occurs above this A equals to two Q line. And along this line, the growth is maximal. Okay. So as expansion proceeds, um, a mode will cross bands that become progressively narrow. Okay, but the width of the bands is, is now, uh, well, broad, and therefore multiple modes can be excited at the same time, right? What happens is that uh, the fastest growing modes corresponds to, uh, well, that, that, that I already said, right? Uh, the modes that uh, live very close to this uh, maximality band, uh, sorry, line. And in this scenario, particles are essentially going to be produced in burst, okay? occurring every time the non-adiabaticity condition is uh, satisfied, right? So the, the, there is a sudden change in the effective frequency of, uh, of, the, of the field, okay? In the literature, this growth is typically studied by connecting two adiabatic regimes with a burst in the middle, essentially, very much like uh, the problem of reflection and transmission in quantum mechanics. Right, so to which it can actually formally be mapped. So, in fact, one can introduce a set of uh, so called Bogolubov coefficients that translate one adiabatic regime to the next one and which will grow during this adiabaticity violation. So, the solution is typically written as a sum of WKV solutions weighed by these Bogolubov coefficients, and the occupation number is simply given by uh, beta squared. Now, this I'm just saying because this is written in, in, in many places. I am not going to discuss preheating in terms of these variables, though, because I think that sometimes they obscure the discussion and they're not quite necessary. Okay. Um, so let's forget about them for, for a minute. The only thing I want to say, uh, in terms of for, uh, to complete the discussion of Floquet theory, is that this uh, resonance parameter, as I hinted uh, before, is none other than the kinematic factor curly R in these guys, eh, modulo one uh, constant, so 16. So essentially, if R is bigger than 16, we have broad resonance. If R is bigger than one, which was this kinematic blocking regime, we have the narrow resonance. And if R is much less than one, where there was no kinematic effects, we could just do the naive computation. That's precisely the naive perturbative uh, limit, OK? Now, talking about uh, scalar fields, we can actually do a little bit better. Marcos, excuse yes. me, what is core R? Uh, sorry, these R, uh, I would have to go back uh, if, if, if I if, well, I can't exit this thing. So the R is, was the, the kinematic parameter uh, that I introduced last time. It's twice the ratio of the effective mass of the field divided by the inflaton mass. Uh, maybe I can actually show it just for a second. Uh, should be here. Well, it's lecture one. Okay, so if you're looking at my screen, I think you are right. Um, 
you can see that we introduced that R here in the context of the kinematic blocking. So the R was the uh, uh, adiabatic, um, uh, sorry, the, the envelope uh, evaluated ratio of the, oops, these are fermions, these are scalars, of twice the mass of the scalar field divided by omega. So if R was bigger than one, we had the kinematic suppression in the perturbative limit, okay? And uh, this R is essentially just connected to this uh, resonance parameter. So when kinematic blocking is efficient is when we, we would expect the resonance to occur. And this is related to the question that was posed yesterday uh, of whether or not it made, it made sense to, to actually discuss the, the decay in terms of the blocking uh, because we have to deal with non adiabaticity So I will show that in the next slide, in the very next slide. Uh, before saying that, uh, the only thing I want to say just for generality is that uh, we can do a little bit better. Uh, this helps also understand um, the nature of the resonance. We can not only assume that the, the inflaton is coupled to, to chi and therefore is producing scalar fields, but also we can also we, we can think that this chi is coupled to, let's say, a pair of fermions, for example, so it can decay also uh, during reheating, okay, so we have phi producing chi, which is decaying into some uh, light uh, fermion fields in this case. So we can uh, also write it's uh, in this case it's perturbative decay rate because this is the best we can do for now, okay, with a time dependent mass that is going to depend, of course, on the oscillation of the inflaton field. So one can pose a slightly more general system of equations. Uh, one can introduce quantis, quantization friendly, sorry, variables to write down the equation of motion for this unstable scalar in terms of the canonically normalized field uh, modulated by the exponential decay. And uh, for this field, the effective frequency would be the same one that I, well, sorry, I, I hadn't showed this one before. So this now, one thing I have to apologize, I didn't mention this before. These derivatives are taken with respect to conformal time now. Uh, I, I think I forgot to introduce that somewhere in here, but these derivatives are now with respect to conformal time, not to cosmic time. So the equations of motion change a little bit. Um, and the effective frequency is given now in conformal time by uh, the commoving momentum squared plus uh, the scale factor multiplied by the effective mass. There is this negative uh, term that depends on the uh, on the second derivative of the scale factor. This is the same term that as this one, okay, the one that I mentioned that could lead to uh, a suppression of the particle production rate. And now uh, if the scalar is unstable, it can also depend on its decay rate also with a negative sign. So if this, the scalar is unstable, essentially the resonance can be uh, suppressed, okay? And uh, one can write down the energy density and uh, the occupation number for such a scalar field. Okay, I have to emphasize this is the UV convergent energy density. Um, why am I saying this? Because if one starts from the Lagrangian that I showed a few slides ago and computes the energy momentum tensor just from first principles, the expression that one gets for rho of chi is generically diverging in, in the ultraviolet. One has to uh, re regularize it. And the way to regularize it is precisely consistent with uh, what we know from uh, the Boltzmann equation, essentially. So this occupation number plays the role of the, fa the phase space distribution. And then multiplying by the frequency, we get the energy density of the field, all right? So uh, we can compute then this phase space distribution. As I said, in the field picture, the phase space distribution of the field is nothing but the occupation number of the uh, momentum modes. So here, uh, of course, I made another typo here. There's f of psi, it should be f of chi, but okay. Uh, I am I'm going to uh, show you the comparison between computing this phase space distribution using this non-perturbative uh, formalism or using the Boltzmann equation. And here by perturbative full, uh, what I mean is the following. I'm going to have to go back a few slides. Uh, yes, actually a lot of slides. You see, for this discussion, I was assuming that F was much less than one. 
what happens if I keep it? If I keep it, I can also solve the Boltzmann equation numerically. So let's see if that uh, coincides with the non perturbative computation. Okay, so we can do it. The phase space distribution is going to evolve during reheating. The black curve, as I said, is the one that we compute from this non perturbative uh, field uh, formalism, let's say. The, the dashed one, the green one, is the one that we get from the naive solution of the Boltzmann equation. And the orange one is when we solve the Boltzmann equation, including the bosonic enhancement effects. And you can see that in terms of the physical momentum normalized by the mass of the inflaton, particles are produced uh, essentially very efficiently at the beginning of reheating. But then uh, this peak is being redshifted by expansion and successive particle decay, sorry, successive inflaton decays populate the distribution less and less efficiently. Okay, so this peak is the first burst of uh, particles produced at the very end of inflation. Okay, so this is an important thing to keep in mind. This is for relatively weak coupling. So this effective coupling sigma divided by lambda is equal to 10. For stronger coupling, one needs to use a logarithmic scale in the vertical axis, and one can also compare the form of the distribution. So the black one is the non perturbatively computed one. We can see how particles are being injected into the plasma at uh, m5, uh, sorry, at p equals to m5. Okay. The green one is the naive uh, Boltzmann solution. The uh, orange one is the full Boltzmann solution. And the result is that neither of the two is actually a very good approximation to the, uh, to the solution. Here it looks like it underestimates it by a little bit, but you see this is a log scale. So it can actually be of. Uh, uh, orders of magnitude difference between the between this computation. This one that contains the bosonic enhancement from Boltzmann is actually doing a terrible job. So the point is that if you're in the strong coupling regime, you have to do the non uh, perturbative calculation uh, in any case. And this shows up when we compute the uh, energy density stored in the radiation coming from this uh, particular inflaton decay channel. Okay. So uh, to, the, to the right, I am showing the form of the occupation number uh, as a function of uh, momenta rescaled by the whole parameter at the end of inflation. So essentially, uh, modes to the left are, uh, where, are outside the horizon, modes to the right are inside the horizon. OK. And uh, here, for the uh, energy density, I am showing four different curves. OK. So the, the dotted one, the blue dotted one, corresponds to the perturbative result if we ignore all of the condensate effects that I discussed yesterday, okay? So no kinematic blocking, no uh, vacuum transition computation, just stick the perturbative decay rate that you compute in the vacuum into the equations of motion and see what you get, okay? The dot dashed curve, which is also blue, contains the full perturbative computation, okay? That one includes the kinematic blocking effect, the black curve is a non perturbative uh, computation for a stable scalar field. And the uh, purple curve, which is dashed, corresponds to the non perturbative result for an unstable scalar field. Okay. So there are four curves here for uh, coupling, which is sigma over lambda equal to 10. And the important thing to see here is that, that uh, although none of them are exactly the same, they are very close to each other. In particular, the, uh, the unstable field uh, result is very similar to the full perturbative computation, while the uh, non perturbative, uh, sorry, the, the stable scalar field in the non perturbative picture has, a, has an energy density that is slightly lower than the perturbative one. Okay. And this is related to the uh, suppression that I mentioned before that is coming from. Uh, the equation of state parameter at the beginning of reheating. I will mention this again in a minute. If we increase the coupling, then the, the perturbative result with uh, ignoring condensate effects and that con uh, containing condensate, condensate effects are very different now. You see, they are separated by one order of magnitude in, in rho max, okay? So this line is completely wrong. It doesn't contain any uh, microphysical information. But you see, uh, for the uh, perturbative one, including condensate effects, uh, that one is actually a very good fit 
So these two other non-perturbative curves, depending on the regime. If the scalar field is unstable, then uh, the energy density at the beginning of reheating is very similar to the perturbative result. But then at some point, the decay into uh, light fields becomes very efficient and it, the energy density is transferred to those uh, other uh, light fields. And so it uh, just redshifts very quickly. For the stable uh, scalar field produced non perturbatively we can see that the matching between the full condensate result and the non perturbative computation, the, the parametric resonance computation, is exactly the same at late times. So this is what I was saying yesterday. Despite the fact that for this coupling, the R parameter is bigger than one, uh, the perturbative computation, including the kinematic blocking, is a very good fit to the full non-perturbative calculation, something that you shouldn't expect, okay? But uh, this means that what we did yesterday is not completely wrong. It is actually has a, a range of validity. And we can see that occupation numbers here are now bigger than one, okay? So uh, they start growing and growing as we increase the value of the coupling. If we make the coupling sufficiently large, then the uh, agreement between perturbation theory and uh, the Floquet result breaks down. Now we are starting to see the effect of the uh, broad resonance, the, these big, uh, long lasting particle production events, uh, because again, occupation numbers are now uh, very large. Okay, so uh, perturbative result gives this curve the non-perturbative computation for an unstable scalar field is still very well matched at the beginning of reheating, but then uh, all of the energy density is being stolen by other light degrees of freedom, while for the scalar, sorry, the stable scalar field, you see it stays there close to the, to the other curves until broad resonance uh, shows up. The energy density grows very quickly, but at this point, it has crossed already the resonance band the growth stops, and after that, the energy density just uh, uh, redshifts away, all right? If we increase even more the, the coupling, occupation numbers now become gigantic. So this is 10 to the 10. The system essentially becomes classical. If we have very large occupation numbers, then we're essentially talking about the classical field. And we see that uh, the parametric resonance has increased the maximum value of uh, the energy density in the scalar by four orders of magnitude. So perturbation theory is definitely uh, completely wrong in this regime. We have to do the full resonance analysis. And we can see that we're uh, entering the so-called back reaction regime. This energy density and the energy density of the inflaton are now comparable, okay? The fact that these uh, occupation numbers are so large, as I said, make uh, the classical, uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, allow us to study this system uh, without, uh, allow us to study this system ignoring uh, quantum effects. Occupation numbers are very large and we can use uh, a classical sol solver, which corresponds to uh, lattice codes, okay? So before I, I, I go further into the lattice codes, uh, that means that we can separate the dynamics depending on the, 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 well, the relevant dynamics during reheating, depending on the strength of the effective coupling. If this effective coupling is very small, the particle production is dominated essentially by gravitational effects. What do I mean by gravitational effects? I mean, this term is very small. And so the one that leads to the parametric resonance is this guy, okay? so we have gravitational particle production. When sigma over lambda is of order one, the gravitational term and the non-adiabatic term coming from the coupling to the inflaton have opposite signs and you actually get a suppression in the particle production rate. For sigma in this regime, the perturbative computation is actually very good and we can match the maximum energy density of the, of the field after uh, inflation. As sigma over lambda becomes of the order of 10 to the three and larger, broad resonance takes place. And you can actually see here some uh, bands that correspond to, uh, to, to, the mode, to the modes passing through these broad uh, resonance uh, bands in that, um, in that parameter space. And finally, if the coupling is too big, then we enter the back reaction regime. The maximum energy density in the scalar field 
cannot be bigger than the energy density contained in the inflaton and we reach a plateau, okay? This line corresponds to the, what I'm calling the heart free approximation, which is what I've been using so far. The points are uh, corresponding to the lattice uh, cold computation. And I will mention what the difference between these two is right now. You see, um, for, uh, <clears throat> sorry, in the back reaction regime, the coupling between the uh, inflaton field and the scalar field is so large that we cannot ignore the back reaction of the, of the production of chi particles into the equation of motion of the inflaton, okay? We have to take into account now how the inflaton uh, oscillation is changed by the production of chi particles. In the homogeneous, the homogeneous limit is known as a Hartree approximation. So essentially we uh, encode this interaction like uh, in this form, okay? We assume that the only thing that uh, this coupling does is to modify the equation of motion for the homogeneous uh, inflaton field. And that is what I, uh, what I use to produce this line and uh, these plots, essentially. Some of these plots, sorry. But uh, in reality, of course, if this coupling is so big, then the inflaton field uh, cannot possibly continue being a homogeneous field. It actually gets fragmented into pieces. And in that case, one can use uh, lattice codes to track the evolution of fields. So in, for lattice codes, what you do is you solve the classical equation of motion, but no longer in the homogeneous limit. Now you take into account the space-time dependence of the inflaton field and the other scalar field, and uh, well, gradients that uh, that uh, are induced by the decay of the of, of the field, uh, and this is just the interaction term. Okay, so this is a plot that is trying to uh, show precisely the, the dynamics of the of the energy density of the inflaton as you increase the value of the coupling. If the coupling is not gigantic, then most of the energy density in the inflaton field is contained in the condensate. So the condensate is shown in magenta. The total energy density of the inflaton field is shown in red. And you can see the energy density contained in particles that is in free inflaton particles is subdominant. So here the inflaton is just composed of the oscillating condensate. But for a strong uh, coupling, what happens is that very quickly after the end of inflation, the condensate is traded by just a gas of free inflaton uh, particles, okay? The field has fragmented and we can no longer speak about uh, the oscillating inflaton field phi, okay? This can also be seen by comparing, uh, sorry, by looking at the evolution of the equation of state parameter during uh, reheating. So here I am showing the energy density of the inflaton up here and the energy density of the uh, scalar decay product as a function of time, but in, for increasing values of the coupling. If the coupling is not too big, the equation of state parameter just stays at zero. We have the usual matter dominated era during reheating, but if we increase it, you see the equation of state parameter can uh, develop a transient that pushes it away from uh, matter domination. And in fact, for very large couplings, this equation of state parameter can be that of uh, radiation momentarily during reheating before the inflaton has finished decaying. So this is a very interesting uh, thing. Um, okay, let me go through this very quickly because I'm running out of time and I haven't talked about fermions. So uh, uh, let me just mention uh, instant preheating. So the the... The idea behind instant preheating is the following. Here, I, as you see, I have been increasing the value of the coupling more and more and more, and therefore we can extract a lot of energy density from the inflaton um, very quickly. Uh, in fact, if this coupling, the, effect, the effective coupling is extremely big, that is the coupling between phi and chi is of order one, then uh, the, the energy density of the inflaton field can be immediately transferred to, uh, to chi's, which if they are unstable, can decay into standard model particles during the first oscillation, okay? So one can actually do the computation of what is the uh, energy density stored in chi after the first oscillation. It depends on the energy density in phi and on the coupling. 
So as I said, for the first oscillation, if the coupling is of order one, it is very large, preheating can happen instantaneously, and that's what's called uh, instant preheating. Uh, I had some plots. There's not much of a point to, to discuss them because I already mentioned, uh, I already said what I wanted to say. Let me go very quickly through uh, fermion preheating. So uh, if the inflaton couples through fermions, then the effect of the parametric resonance also exists. One can write down the, the Dirac equation for a fermion in uh, the expanding universe, okay? In this case, I am writing it directly in terms of conformal time. And again, if one neg neglects expansion, the uh, resonant effect is, uh, appears for the uh, mode functions of this uh, psi field. So the inflaton oscillates every time it crosses zero. Well, here it's not very clear, uh, but okay. The, the mode functions of the fermion also have this uh, jumping behavior and the same happens with the uh, occupation number. But as you can see, instead of growing exponentially fast with time, this occupation number is jumping between values located at, uh, sorry, between, uh, yeah, it's jumping for values that are less than one in this case, okay? This is a manifestation of the uh, Fermi Dirac statistics. Fermions cannot accumulate inside of, a, of an energy level beyond a certain point. You can only have one fermionic state per level, essentially. If one turns on expansion, then uh, something similar to the bosonic case happens. We have the decrease in the amplitude of the oscillation of the inflaton, and the stochastic uh, resonance appears also for uh, the mode functions and the occupation numbers. But again, they never go above a certain value. All right. Uh, let me just mention a little bit of the formal lesson to show you finally the plots and uh, probably end uh, the discussion. So for fermions to study the parametric resonance, one has to do some uh, a little bit more of work than in the case of scalars. The canonically normalized variable in this case is chosen to be proportional to the scale factor to the, to the three halves so that we obtain in conformal time exactly the Dirac equation, meaning we can quantize this canonically normalized field in the usual way in terms of the uh, U and B spinners and the creation and annihilation operators, uh, it is convenient to decompose these U and B spinners in terms of the helicity eigen, eigenstates, which are denoted here by, by chi, that introduces two functions, U1 and U2, that satisfy this set of uh, ordinary differential equations now with an effective frequency that depends only on the effective mass squared. So there, there are no interference effects here at all. Uh, and uh, you can solve these equations, write down the corresponding uh, occupation number. So this would be the phase space distribution for fermions and the energy density for them. And in the same way as we did for uh, the bosons, we can compare the phase space distribution obtained uh, non-perturbatively with the one obtained perturbatively. So this is for weak couplings, you see that Yukawa is 10 to minus 6. It is less than 10 to minus 5 because that's precisely where the boundary between perturbative dynamics and non-perturbative dynamics is, as, uh, uh, as advertised before. So if we turn on the, the, the simulation, let's say, this is the p to the minus 3 half uh, distribution that I showed you at the very beginning in the context of thermalization. And the black curve is the non-perturbative result. So you see, it is exactly the same one, except that it has some oscillations on top of the, uh, on top of this uh, this Boltzmann result. But they are one and the same. It even has the same uh, cutoff in the UV at one half of the mass of the inflaton. So everything we said about thermalization, about uh, the phase space distribution, applies also non-perturbatively in the limit of weak couplings. If the coupling is made strong, it is large, then the shape is not the same. You see, this would be the Boltzmann uh, shape for the distribution in the absence of the fermionic uh, blocking. This is the full Boltzmann solution, which now overestimates the, the bosonic, the fermionic suppression. And this one in the middle is a non perturbative result. So it still has the cutoff at M5 divided by two but the shape is no longer the one that we uh, showed uh, a few slides ago. 
So again, if you are in the strong coupling regime, which precisely corresponds to y bigger than 10 to the minus 5, then you have to do the full non-perturbative analysis. And you can see this uh, in terms of the energy densities or energy density of the fermion. Okay, At small coupling, the perturbative computation agrees perfectly with the non-perturbative one. So everything is as we uh, computed yesterday. But if the coupling is uh, big, it is bigger than 10 to the minus 5, then you see we get three different lines here. Okay, The, the dotted one is a naive perturbative computation ignoring condensate effects. This one here includes the condensate effects. So there is a suppression, a kinematic suppression. But the black one, which is the full non-perturbative calculation, uh, is actually interpolating between the two, you see. At the beginning, there is barely any kinematic suppression, so the, the maximum energy density is essentially the same as the naive perturbative one. But very quickly, the, the blocking in the energy levels of the fermion shows up. The energy density is suppressed very quickly. It is actually suppressed below the, the perturbative computation, and it only joins it after a sufficient amount of time. You can actually compare the mean non-perturbative rate to the perturbative rate for different values of the coupling. In all cases, the two agree if you wait a sufficient uh, amount of time. Okay, So all of these tend to one. It's just that if the coupling is small, it does it very quickly. But if it's bigger than 10 to minus 5, then it takes it uh, a little bit of time. And so to conclude this part about uh, preheating for the most part, uh, let me just mention what uh, we learned so far. We already know what the perturbative pipeline looks like. Okay, what do I mean by pipeline? I mean the following. We saw that at very early times, we can compute, we can find uh, the, the, the nature, the phase space distribution, the microphysics, and the decay of the inflaton in terms of this uh, field picture. Okay, so we um, essentially ignore the dissipation in the inflaton and only compute the effect on the fluctuations of the field. So that's what I mean by limited dissipation. At late times, the fluid picture is very convenient because uh, thermalization happens, fluctuations become just thermal fluctuations, which we know how to deal with. And we can only think in terms of dissipation. The inflaton decays exponentially fast, and uh, we obtain reheating eventually. In the middle, then to determine how we transition from this picture to this picture, we have to look at interactions in the plasma. We have to worry about thermalization. And as I, and, uh, and as I showed at the beginning, this can be done if the couplings are not super large in terms of effective Boltzmann equations that can be approximated uh, um, you know, in some way. If you're in the non-perturbative regime, then the, all of the assumptions built upon uh, these Boltzmann equations fail, and the thermalization is probably much more complicated. So uh, as far as I understand, you, there is no way around it. You have to use the full quantum version of the Boltzmann equation, which is known as the katanov bain uh, equations that essentially tell you how Green's, function evolves, if Green's functions evolve in the absence of thermal equilibrium. And of course, in the literature, this full problem has not been addressed uh, completely. Okay, let me uh, skip this bit. Uh, well, let me just mention it just uh, in one sentence. Okay, um, remembering that it is the oscillation of the inflaton what produces uh, particles and not the decay of inflaton quanta. Uh, during reheating, we can actually access kinematically disallowed regions through the parametric resonance, and we can produce super heavy particles, particles that are as uh, massive or even more massive than the inflaton field, which are uh, generically called in the literature Wimsilla. So we can exploit this parametric resonance to produce things that we would expect to be uh, disallowed simply by uh, looking at uh, kinematics. Also, I only discuss um, parametric resonance for k equals to 2 for a quadratic potential. But of course, we, will be, we can wonder what happens when the potential is not quadratic. When the potential is not quadratic, uh, one can show, and I briefly discussed that yesterday as well, that uh, the 
kinematic parameter uh, bigger, uh, bigger than one is encountered for most of the parameter space. And these plots are showing essentially the, um, the coupling for the fermions or for the bosons. And then uh, orange regions correspond to R bigger than one at some point during reheating. And you see for K equals to four, essentially for all of these range of couplings, it is equal, uh, uh, the, sorry, the, the resonance cannot be ignored. For K equals to six, it never can be ignored. Something similar happens to the fermions. And so you have always have to worry about preheating. The problem is that, um, when you have k equals k bigger than two, uh, then uh, the homogeneous inflaton can also pump energy into its own fluctuations. You see, for k equals to two at the minimum, we have a non-interacting theory. So the inflaton doesn't interact with itself. But if we have k equals to four or k equals to six, as one has, for example, in this family of potentials known as the alpha attractors, then uh, we have the phi to the k potential, the inflaton can interact with itself, and this self-interaction results in self-resonance. So now we have to keep track of the resonance of phi and its decay products, and that makes lattice codes indispensable. So some people have explored uh, the effect, for example, on the background dynamics, and what they find is that for k equals to two, the equation of state parameter during reheating uh, in the absence of these uh, resonant effects essentially stays always at uh, zero unless you have very strong couplings as I showed before. But for, uh, for k equals to four, you enter radiation domination immediately as I uh, mentioned yesterday as well. But for k equals to six, for example, despite the fact that you would expect an equation of state parameter for a homogeneous field to satisfy a, a certain relation, which is shown as the dot, as the dashed line, the self-resonance of the inflaton destroys the condensate and uh, and uh, uh, turns it into a radiate a, a bath, a thermalized bath of uh, decay products and inflaton uh, particles. Okay, so here's the simulations that they did for k equals to two. Uh, strong couplings can destroy the inflaton condensates. These are regions where uh, we have an overdensity uh, in, in the inflaton field. Um, and in fact, uh, for some scenarios, you can produce very long-lived uh, quasi-stable uh, solitons, which are called uh, oscillons in this con context. Or for uh, larger values of K, you just destroy the condensate and end up with a gas of free inflatons. So the, the analysis is much more complicated. In fact, depending on the nature of the field that fragments, you can have what are known as uh, cue balls or boson stars if the, the field that, that um, fragments is a complex field, okay? So cue balls are uh, in this, uh, Sorry, these solitons are known as cue balls. If their uh, shape is determined by a self interaction, they're known as boson stars. If their shape is preserved by gravity, if the field is real, uh, in the self interacting case, they're called as oscillons. In the gravitational case, they're called as oscillotons. And maybe I can stop here because I already ran out of time. So um, I think I covered most of what I wanted. Okay, thank you uh, for your nice lectures. Mm -hmm. Again, I think that I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions during the uh, lectures. So yeah, you can ask any question now. Yeah, may I ask uh, some question on the picture from preheating to reheating? So yes. there you mentioned that in the fifth picture, we neglect this, yeah, dissipation of the impact on sector, but yes. by having a regional production of the chi field and by having, by considering the energy conservation, there should be some dissipation. Oh yes, definitely there should be some dissipation. That, mm -hmm. that is for sure. Uh, the point is that this dissipation, uh, unless you are in the back reaction regime, for example, here where the energy densities of the decay product and the inflaton are comparable, mm -hmm. <clears throat> sorry, uh, you typically have this, this scenario that uh, despite the fact that you have, you can have, you know, uh, uh, efficient particle production, 
the, the energy density of the inflaton field at the end of inflation is very large. And so the amount that you lose to, to the decay products mm -hmm. uh, is essentially negligible. They only become comparable if you wait long enough near the end of uh, reheating. So uh, most uh, studies do, do precisely that. This is the, the heart tree approximation, as I mentioned before, for uh, preheating at early times, okay? So uh, the, the way the, the, the equations of motion are written are ignoring dissipation. As you say, you, you are not supposed to ignore it. So, so there are ways to, to take this into account in, in some sense. For example, that's the reason why I, I was discussing not just a scalar field, but an unstable scalar field, right? So the dissipation is here and you can uh, take energy density from the inflaton to chi, which decays into, into radiation. But this is an effective equation, by the way. So you shouldn't trust it too much. I mean, I right. cannot just stick a perturbative decay rate into the equations of motion. That's what we did yesterday, uh, talking in the phenomenological picture of reheating. Uh, more sophisticated analysis has to be done. Usually, and I forgot to mention that, usually uh, what you would do, for example, in a, in a statistical system would be to relate fluctuation and dissipation through what is known as the Kubo formula. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with it, if you remember it uh, from, from studies of, uh, how is this called, linear response theory. You can relate fluctuation and dissipation. The problem is that uh, the cubo formula uh, relies on the assumption of adiabaticity. And as we saw, adiabaticity is badly violated in general. Right. So you cannot use the cubo formula. You have to use something horrible from first principles to, to actually keep track of both things, dissipation and fluctuation. I see. So... So it's, it is a very valid question. I mean, uh, you're not supposed to, to ignore uh, any of the two. It's just mm -hmm. that the nature of the dynamics lets you approximate things uh, in either of the two regimes and the interpolation is the tricky part, okay? So if you just care about energy densities, then eh, maybe you don't care too much about the detail of thermalization. If you care about the details of particle production, for example, dark matter production that I'm hoping I have time to address tomorrow, mm -hmm. then all these things matter and matter a lot. So, so it is important. It is, a, it is an open field in, in, in early universe cosmology to, to study you know, um, dissipation and particle production in the strong coupling regime. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, the chemical. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if a produced scalar chi has an additional mass, which is not from the oscillated inflaton condensate, yes. how much the story can be changed? Oh, the story can be changed uh, significantly. In particular, most of the things change in, let me go to this rainbow picture, uh, in this regime, let's say, okay? If the, if the uh, effective coupling is very large, then uh, as you can uh, tell from the form of the effective mass, which I have hidden in a very, somewhere here, yes, well, not here, this one, the effective mass, okay? This uh, value, so sorry, for a quadratic potential, as I showed, I, I tried to, to, to show, preheating is most efficient at the early stages of the decay of the inflaton. That's why it's called preheating because it's before the complete reheating of, uh, of the universe. So uh, it is more sensitive to the beginning of reheating because this value, this phi is the largest at the end of inflation. It's a order of M Planck. And so uh, you would need a very large bare mass to be able to compete with a, with a Planck mass here if the coupling is relatively large. But as you mentioned, if the bare coupling is uh, of the same order as this one, then you can have preheating at the beginning of, uh, of reheating and then it immediately shuts down. There is, the, the field doesn't show any broad resonance whatsoever because this bare mass just makes the, the decay kinematically disallowed and you don't get the, the resonance uh, effect. So you would see uh, at most, let's say some um, some growth here that would get killed very much like this, uh, like this uh, dashed line. Okay, so you get some growth and then just redshift because the the field it can no longer be excited by uh, 
by the parametric resonance. Uh, I'm hoping that answers your question. Thank you very much. Uh, if the Behemoth is large, the story can be changed. Yes, 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 of course. If the bear mass is large, then the story changes uh, and uh, you, you, your, um, your parametric resonance gets suppressed. So that's the... Thank you very much. Just... Okay, Tongyan? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so one simple question. So when you uh, talked about the non-perturbative pipeline of, uh, pre, you know, reading, from yeah. pre-eating to reading, uh, you said that in principle, in terms of when you want to do things very non-perturbatively and you know very uh, strictly, you have to consider the quantum mechanical version of the Boltzmann equation, which is like in like uh, listed over here. But are actually is there like references that actually implicate this uh, equation to like calculate robustly calculate the thermalization? Uh, that is a very, very good question. Um, I uh, must have some references. I unfortunately, you, know, you see, I didn't put them here. Um, if from the top of my head, I don't remember them. There are some people, uh, for example, there, uh, one paper I remember is a paper by um, uh, Marco Drues. Uh, D R E W E S, uh, where they try to, um, you know, find a reasonable limit of these equations to uh, the, they, they don't they are not after thermalization, they're after uh, looking at uh, thermal effects after thermalization is complete on uh, the decay of the impacton field, but it's kind of related. But a robust computation in the context of reheating using the Schringer Keldish uh, formalism. Um, I am actually not so sure. Uh, I, I, I mean, I can look for a, a, a reference if, if you want. Um, I, can, I can add them to the, to the list of references uh, if you wish. From the top of my head, I don't remember them. I mean, what the most I've seen is the, you know, some uh, simple, applications of these uh, of these uh, equations mostly in the context of phase transitions uh, actually but uh, to do a full computation of thermalization as uh, Harihaya, Mukaida, Yamada did using the Boltzmann equation I don't think there is one uh, I mean as in general, principle you I have to like you know use these equations to be consistent in terms of the non perturbative pipeline right yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in order to be consistent, that's what you should be using. So uh, you should be looking at, at, at these sort of equations. In practice, as I said, I think it's very complicated. So, so I mean, e even last month, there was another paper on thermalization during reheating, and they still shy away from these, uh, from, from these uh, sort of equations. They, they essentially recover the same result that I showed at the beginning from the from the Japanese uh, authors. Uh, so they, they mention a little bit of this, but uh, solving these equations, I think, is I I honestly don't have a, a hands-on experience. Um, but uh, but I think uh, uh, as as you said, a robust computation and it's probably missing from the literature. Thank you very maybe, much. Maybe yeah, maybe if you look hard enough, you can find something. Um, but I'm I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm 99% sure that it's not generic. It must be applied to some particular uh, scenario. Thank you. Uh, so okay. one more key question. So relating to Shintaro's previous questions, when you talk about the instantaneous solarization, uh, as yes. you said, we have uh, standard model particles and gauge bosons. Yes. But does that estimation still valid when we when implant doesn't have a direct coupling to standard model particles as well? Uh, that is a very good question. So is the computation still valid? Uh, I would say the answer is probably not. Um, but you will have to think what the inflaton not being coupled to standard model uh, particles means. If you uh, segregate the the inflaton field from uh, the decay product, let, let me let me think for a second because 
uh, you would have to decay in steps, right? The inflaton <laughs> would have to decay into some particles, and this, and then these other particles would have to produce the standard mole degrees of freedom. Uh, that is possible. That's that's in fact, um, for example, this uh, scenario that I was uh, trying to to show here. You see, this chi might not be the any particle in the standard model. So through its decay, it might actually produce the standard model particles. So that is true. In that case, the, the result for thermalization would change. Yes, because uh, you see the, the, the distributions that uh, we computed here, right? That we use to determine the thermalization time scale depended on the fact that these particles were produced from uh, the decay of the inflaton condensate. So this uh, p to the minus three half uh, exponent depends precisely uh, on uh, the phase space distribution of the inflaton. But when you have this, the sequential decay, so the inflaton decays into something and this something decays into standard model particles, modifies the shape of the phase space distribution. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a slide here. Um, this is something that uh, that we have calculated, and uh, the the form of the distribution can change a lot. So that would mean the thermalization process would have to be recalculated for this for that scenario. Mm -hmm. My guess is probably the the time scale doesn't change too much because in any case uh, it depends on the on on the standard model gauge couplings, but uh, it, you know, it might, it might be uh, affected somewhat, I, I would say, in particular this term here, right? Where you're assuming phi decays in, in, in directly to standard models. So in any case, I don't want to uh, beat around the bush. The answer is yes, it, it will change. Well, I see. Yeah, thank you. And maybe it's a kind of cascade to the case. You have, uh, you may have some box shape Spectrum is instead of monochromatic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the spectrum, spectrum, the spectrum is not going to be the same. Uh, uh, right. Now you're not decaying at one precise uh, mm -hmm. energy, but it's right, actually right. probably. Right. So, so you have to do it more carefully. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I ask like, one mm -hmm. short question? Mm -hmm. uh, so when we like calculate, uh, let's say, non perturbative, you know, uh effects using the lattice and i think you show like you plot with you know the maximum energy density depending on like the uh sigma over lambda and yeah this one so there's the heart tree approximation and there's the lattice calculations but is there any reason why we can't do the lattice in the perturbative regime or is there oh. is it just like a practical reason that we don't need to or is it yeah, that, that is, is there like a reason that is a very valid question uh the, the problem with the lattice is that uh, the lattice computation is a uh, classical calculation. You see, these fields are not quantum mm -hmm. fields. So yeah. what the lattice does is essentially to solve a system of coupled wave equations. Okay, so you have, uh, you know, phi and chi, you have the Lagrangian, you compute the Euler-Lagrange equations, you get two wave equations coupled to each other through the potentials, mm -hmm. and the lattice okay. Uh, computation just solves that classical system, okay, in the expanding universe. But that means uh, that we haven't quantized the fields at all, the the the, the scalar fields at all, and uh, that 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 uh, can only be valid if occupation numbers are sufficiently big, okay. That only applies if occupation numbers are much bigger than one. If they are not then you have no right to compute the, the to use the lattice to compute the particle production rates. In particular here, for example, which lives in the perturbative regime, the occupation numbers are less than one always. So no way that the classical computation is accurate. And this is something that you can do. In fact, if you plug in this coupling into the lattice, instead of getting this result, you get something that is many orders of magnitude mm -hmm. bigger than this thing. So it's completely wrong. Uh, uh, actually, it's not only wrong, it is very dependent on the lattice spacing and on the, on the, mm -hmm. on the initial conditions. So uh, you don't get a unique answer. To, to, to fit the lattice results to the uh, correct one, let's say, uh, you need to compute this one anyway. 
So it's not uh, it's not practical. It, it is only after your coupling is in this regime, essentially near the broad resonance. Eh, as long as you're in the broad resonance regime, you can trust the lattice, in fact. So uh, here, if you take your lattice code, you change the initial condition, you change the lattice, the, the box size and the uh, graining in momentum and all these things, the, the code always gives you a unique answer, which means you're doing things correctly. And in fact, uh, you can check occupation numbers are given. But that, that is, the, that is the, the answer, essentially. This is a purely classical calculation that ignores any uh, quantum nature of the fields. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect yeah, sense. Other, otherwise, uh, if you wanted to compute things in the, um, you know, still quantizing the fields, the, anything in, in the back reaction regime is going to be extremely complicated because uh, upon quantization, this mm -hmm. equation becomes an oper a nonlinear operator equation, which is, I mean, I, I have no idea how to solve those things. So, so uh, the key point here is that uh, occupation numbers are huge. Actually, that's the reason why not a lot has been done for fermions in the strong regime, okay? Yeah. If you increase the fermionic coupling, then uh, mm -hmm. you know you have uh, stronger and stronger non-perturbative effects, but your occupation number is always tiny. It never is bigger than, much bigger than one. So you still have to do this, uh, these, these sort of analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, when we were working on a paper, I, I asked the one collaborator to check the case with y equals 10 to the minus one. And the only thing that we accomplished was to uh, burn his computer because the, the, the thing just was taking forever. So, so there is no, there are uh, no, there is one lattice code, I think, for fermions, but that one uh, relies on computing uh, expectation values, correlators. You see, if you take psi times psi, then uh, mm -hmm. you know the sum of two spin one half things has a spin zero component, mm -hmm. so that thing is bosonic, and you can use it. But uh, but I don't know how to use it, for example, to extract uh, spectral information and energy densities. Mm -hmm. So. That, that, Thank you very much. You see that that is, that is the thing. You can ask yourself, why can't can't I do it for fermions? Well, because they don't have huge mm -hmm. occupation numbers, so the quantum nature is always there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for your uh, nice discussion. I think that uh, we have a pretty good discussion uh, today. Uh, uh, so uh, tomorrow maybe we have. Uh, more phenomenological discussion by yes. using our result. Yes. Right? So we'll uh, meet at the same time tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. So if you have uh, more questions, you can ask. Uh, as uh, we did uh, before, we are going to unload the lecture note before the lecture start. So you can take a look and also, yeah, I will uh, unload uh, recorded uh, lectures too so if you miss something you can watch it again and you can also ask a question for the first two lectures if you have any questions yes okay, okay.